So as we resume Hosea chapter 4, we find ourselves in the middle of a rather long and much needed rebuke from the Lord. God has sent his prophet Hosea to the northern kingdom of Israel to call her out on her idolatry. This is something that the northern kingdom has done ever since her inception upon the two kingdoms originating. When the kingdom of Israel split, ever since the kingdom split into two, the northern kingdom has been steeped in idolatry. You'll recall that after the death of Solomon, his son Rehoboam took the throne and through some unwise counsel, he sought to solidify his position by coming down harder on the people than his his father had. They were already suffering because some of the things that Solomon had put on him, he said, I'm going to come down on you guys even harder. And this caused the kingdom to split. Rehoboam became the king over the southern portion, which went on to be called the kingdom of Judah, and the northern portion went on to be known as the kingdom of Israel. Interestingly enough, God in advance, uh, he, he chose, he chose and he promised Jeroboam the first that he would be the one to rule over the northern kingdom. He would rule over 10 tribes in the north and God would build him an enduring house and he would establish his kingdom just as he promised, get this, just as he promised to build David an enduring house. Now, obviously, this would not be on the same magnitude as David's house because the Messiah would come through David's house. But nonetheless, this is what God promised in 1 Kings chapter 11. So keep your finger there in Hosea 4 and turn back to 1 Kings chapter 11. We'll put it up on the screen for you too. It says, now it happened at that time when Jeroboam went out of Jerusalem, that the prophet Ahijah, the uh, Shalonamite, Shalonamite, I guess that's how you say it, met him on the way. And he had him him clothe himself with a new garment, and the two were alone in the field. Then Ahijah took hold of the new garment that was on him, and he tore it into 12 pieces. And then he said to Jeroboam, take for yourself 10 pieces. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, behold, I will tear the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon, and I will give ten tribes to you. But he shall have one tribe for the sake of my servant David and for the sake of Jerusalem, the city which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, because they have forsaken me and worshipped Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, Cheshmoth, the goddess of the Moabites, and Milcom, the god of the people of Ammon, and have not walked in my ways to do what is right in my eyes, and keep my statutes and my judgments, as did his father David. Idolatry is causing disruption. Jeroboam knows this on the front hand. It's causing the kingdom to be ripped apart because they weren't trusting in the Lord. In verse 34, he says, However, I will not take the whole kingdom out out of his hands because I made him ruler over all the days of his life for the sake of my servant David, whom I chose, but he kept my commandments and my statutes. But I will take the kingdom out of his son's hand and give it to you ten tribes. And to his sons I will give one tribe, that my servant David may always have a lamp before me in Jerusalem, the city which I have chosen for myself to put my name there. So I will take you, and you shall reign over all your heart's desires, and you shall be king over Israel. Then it shall be, here here we go, then it shall be, if you heed, All that I command you, walk in my ways and do what is right in my sight to keep my statutes and my commandments as my servant David did, then I will be with you and build for you an enduring house as I built for David and I will give Israel to you. What a tremendous promise. But from the get-go, Jeroboam fails to trust the Lord. He fails to honor God by trusting in his own wisdom, in his own means of provision and protection, instead of trusting in the Lord. Instead of trusting in the Lord and what he could do and what he promised him, he set up idols in the northern kingdom, in Dan and Bethel. He did this according to his own wisdom so that he could keep people from going down to Jerusalem He thought, lest their heart turn towards the king of Judah 
and then I lose all my people. What are you doing? Why are you turning to idolatry? Don't you see that's what caused the kingdom to be split in the first place? In an attempt to keep the northern kingdom and those people and their heart loyal to him and not turn to Judah's king, he decides to trust in his own plan and his own wisdom instead of the Lord. Instead of just honoring him. And he ends up failing to worship God and to honor God in truth, which is always the case whenever you and I trust in our own wisdom above the Lord's wisdom. When you trust in your own understanding above the Lord's understanding, you will fail to honor the Lord. You'll fail to worship him. In 1 Kings chapter 12 and verse 26 it goes on to say this, And Jeroboam said in his heart, Now the kingdom may return to the house of David if these people go up to offer sacrifices in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem. Then the heart of this people will turn back to, the Lord, uh, to their Lord Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they will kill me and go back to Rehoboam, king of Judah. Therefore the king asked advice, made two calves of gold. What are you asking advice for? God already showed you what you need to do. He already told you what to do to secure the kingdom. I'm going to find out some advice elsewhere. Made two golden calves and said to the people, it's too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Here are your gods, O Israel, which brought you up from the land of Egypt. And he set one up in Bethel and the other he put in Dan. Now this, is the, this thing became a sin for the people. Went to worship before one as far as Dan. And he made shrines on the high places and made priests from every class of people who were not of the sons of Levi. The root of idolatry in so many ways is the reversal of the truth we're told about in Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 through 7, which reads as follows. Proverbs 3, verse 5, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. When we trust in self, when we lean on our own understanding, as an understanding that's greater than God's, greater than what he has already revealed, when we fear man and what can happen to us more than we fear God and how we ought to honor him, guess what, brothers and sisters? It leads to idolatry. Anytime we engage that way, it's, it's idolatry. And this idolatry remained a constant problem in Israel, and it ensnared Israel from worshiping the Lord in truth, even though Israel would call upon the name of the Lord. They weren't worshiping the Lord in truth. Yahweh's name was invoked, but they were not worshiping Yahweh in truth. They were, in fact, worshiping idols, all while calling upon the covenant name of the Lord. This false worship was never rooted out by any of the kings of the northern kingdom. Not a single one of them dealt with this sin, what was set up here by Jeroboam I. And the thing is, because that was never dealt with, it only led to further corruption. It only led to deeper and, and, and more frequent and a bigger variety of idolatry in the land. And for this, Israel needs to be sternly rebuked. Judgment is coming and Israel is not going to be able to remain in the land because Israel has refused to take heed and flee from their idolatry. This spiritual unfaithfulness is harlotry. God just calls it for what it is. Israel is his covenant people, and they're cheating on him. They're committing spiritual harlotry. They're prostituting themselves to foreign gods, even though the Lord is their covenant God. And what's worse is that they're completely enslaved to it and unwilling to repent. And so God will discipline and judge Israel for this, but it is with the ultimate aim, as we've seen in the first uh, few chapters, of chasing Israel as a nation back to himself. Hosea chapter 4, verse 11, he says, 
harlotry wine and, and new wine enslave the hearts. Part of, of worshiping the foreign fertility gods, Baal and Ashtoreth, involved acts of fertility. And what I mean by that is sexual intercourse. They would engage in humanistic fertility acts. That's how babies are conceived. And so we're worshiping these fertility gods, and, and they would engage in fertility acts with either a priest or a priestess of Baal. And it also involved the drinking of wine and new wine. In fact, one of the gods of the Amorites was called uh, Tyratu, and he was the god of wine. The name Tyratu literally means young wine or, or new wine. And instead of placing their trust in Yahweh, uh, the true and living God of Israel, so that he might make Israel fruitful, he might increase their crops, he might make them more populous in the land, Israel was trusting in foreign fertility gods. They were trusting in Baal and other false fertility gods to secure their future. And in the end, these gods will leave them empty-handed. They will cause Israel's land and Israel to be depleted. Isn't that interesting? They're seeking to be fruitful by turning to these fertility gods, and in the end, they're not going to be fruitful at all. They're going to receive the opposite of what it is they are looking for, and false gods are like that. They just leave you empty. They promise so much they leave you so empty. People turn to pornography, drugs, fame, power, running after money ad nauseum. You think they're going to fulfill you, and in the end, they just leave you empty. You, you come up short. Whether Israel realizes it or not, they are enslaved to these gods whom they think will fulfill them. But in the end... They're going to lead them to disaster and destruction. There is a certain appeal to our fleshly nature when it comes to false worship. It feels good in the moment. There is instant gratification that seems to produce the results that we're looking for. But ultimately, placing our trust in anything or anyone else other than God himself leaves us enslaved. It leaves us enslaved, unfulfilled, and condemned, left to deal with the mess that we're going to be left in all alone. You'll be left all on your, on your own. Those gods aren't going to help you out. Idolatry leaves a person stuck and, and serving, serving something that only re, removes you further and further away from one, the one who can truly satisfy you. Idolatry leaves you stuck. It leaves you enslaved to serving something that is actually only pulling you away, distancing you from the one who can truly satisfy, the one we were created to be in relationship with and worship, the one who can protect and encourage, and guess what? Pick us up, even in our darkest moments. He will meet us there, and he will serve us. The thing about false gods is, is you got to always tend to them. Our God doesn't have to be tended to. He tends to us. That's a very beautiful reality. The most ironic thing about idolatry is that you're serving a helpless God who only cares and carries an appearance of what it is that you're truly running after what you think you truly want. When you're down and out, you still are going to be stuck in a place where you're going to have to serve them. You'll be enslaved to them, but you're not going to have any real means of anything at your disposal that's going to come as some sort of power and help to aid you and deliver you when you're in a place of utter brokenness. The very place of utter brokenness that serving those idols got you in in the first place. And it just reminds me of the time when the Philistines captured the ark because Israel was trusting, they were trusting the ark was going to help them out. Like they were looking to it instead of God himself. They were treating the ark like a good luck charm instead of trusting in the true and living God. And so they bring the ark to come to help them out with this fight against the Philistines. 
the Israelites do, and they end up losing. And then the Philistines take the ark and they bring it into the temple of their false god, Dagon. In 1 Samuel chapter 5 and verse 1, it says, Then the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. When the Philistines took the ark of God, they brought it into the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. And when the people of Ashdod arose early in the morning, there was Dagon fallen on its face to the earth before the ark of the Lord. Isn't that so hilarious? God's like, let me knock it over. And you're going to have to bow down. It makes that false god bow down to the ark. And so they took Dagon. Guess what? Here's Dagon all falling down and broken. And guess what they have to do? They got to go run over and pick it up and set him in his place. Oh no, our God's fallen over. We better go pick him up. And when they arose early the next morning, there was Dagon fallen on its face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. And the head of Dagon and both the palms of its hands were broken off on the threshold. Only Dagon's torso was left of it. Therefore, neither the priests of Dagon nor any who come into Dagon's house tread on the threshold of Dagon and Ashdod to this day. But the hand of the Lord was heavy upon the people of Ashdod, and he ravaged them and struck them with tumors, both Ashdod and its territory. And when the men of Ashdod saw how it was, they said, The ark of the God of Israel must not remain with us, for his hand is harsh towards us and Dagon, our God. Well, well maybe turn to the true and living God. I'm like, think about what they're snapping to. Israel's God just knocked over our God. I, and he's coming against us. What, what should we do? They, they said, therefore sent and gathered to themselves all the lords of the Philistines. They said, what shall we do with the ark of the God of Israel? And they answered, let the ark of God of Israel be carried away to Gath. So they carried the, the ark of God away, the ark of God of Israel away. The Philistines discovered that their God's helpless. They are able to recognize that Israel's God is more powerful He's, he's, this God is superior to Dagon, and this God is causing doom to come upon them because they stand against the living God. And instead of repenting and turning to Yahweh in truth and going, you know what, we need to return this ark to its rightful owners, and, and we recognize that your God actually is the true God, and we're going to start worshiping him. He's the one who sits on the throne. Instead of doing that, they're like, what do we do? I don't just get this away from us so we don't have to see it. We don't have to deal with this problem anymore. So that life can just go on as usual. And this reminds me of myself when I heard the gospel for the very first time. When I heard the gospel for the very first time, I was in 10th grade. I was at that time, I was just caught up with trying to live a party lifestyle. I just want to hang out with my friends. I just want to party. I just want to go and do these things to serve and please myself, make myself feel good. Uh, this is how I think my life is going to be fulfilled. And so I hear the gospel for the first time, and I'll tell you what, the Spirit of God cut me to the quick. I knew that what was being told to me was true. I was convicted that it was true. And I was also convicted that if I was to surrender my life to this God that I'm being told about, that means I'm going to have to ch my life's going to have to change. And I was like, I don't want my life to change. I want to keep partying. So I just, oh, I'll listen to that another time. You know, just move along. I'll, I'll push this aside. I want my life just to go along as usual. I just love my instant gratification. I love the friends that I had that I made through partying. And I didn't want to change. I just wanted to keep serving at the altars of pleasure that I was serving at. I wanted to, to do things according to my understanding. And here's the funny thing. Even though I was walking according to my understanding, even though I thought, oh yeah, this is the way my life is going to be pleased and fulfilled, you want to know what? It robbed me of life. It robbed me of life. It, 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 it enslaved me. It enslaved me and it blinded me. It robbed me of what I really needed in the end. It destroyed my relationships with my parents. It robbed me 
of getting a better education. I mean, I didn't do so hot in school, you know, <laughs> which could have led to other things in my life. It, it robbed me of things that were, were good. It actually took away things that I enjoyed doing that were actually good and pleasing and fun to do and in their proper place. They're not even sinful. But I was so caught up with these things, I wasn't even able to do those things anymore. It robbed me of life. Here's the beautiful thing. You turn to the Lord and you serve him. I'll tell you what, even when we're enslaved, we're enslaved to God. When we turn to him, we're slaves of God, but we're, we're slaves to the one who is the author of life. So as we serve him, he's only going to usher us down paths of life, down paths of true fulfillment. You become enslaved to an idol, it's going to rob you of life. And not much has changed in 2,800 years. Idolatry still, it still appeals to the flesh, just like it did back then. It robs people of real life, and it enslaves them, just like it did back then. And what's so crazy about Israel worshiping and trusting Baal is that God has already proven himself in time and in space to be reliable. He's already shown that to Israel. He's already shown them that he can deliver. Think about this. Like he's, he's the God who parted the Red Seas. He's the one who established them in the land. He's the one who overthrew their enemies. But time has a way of just making us forget what is true. Sinful desires have a way of just kind of tarnishing how things really are in reality. And time has a way of making us just turn to our own desires and our own way of thinking instead of turning and waiting and trusting upon the God who has been so faithful to us time and time again, the one who's proven to himself who he is in truth. And, and the th fact of the matter is, is we just want what we want, and we want it now, and so we are just willing to serve false gods. And so time has a way of just eroding that which is true and what should be remembered about God, and so we need to be conscientious of that and make it a point to reflect and remember about those things that God has revealed of himself and the things that he's done for us and continually just keep bringing them to the forefront of our mind. If we don't do that, time just has a way of removing those things. And we fail to just see how fa God's been faithful time and time again. I can continue to keep trusting him. And we face new moments each and every day. And sometimes we just think, oh, I don't know if I can trust him here. And we want to go down a false path. Hosea chapter 4, verse 12, he says, My people ask counsel from their wooden idols, and their staff informs them, for the spirit of harlotry has caused them to stray, and they have played the harlot against their God. The Bible does not deny that there is real power behind false idols. Yes, idols are dumb. They are deaf. They're blind. I mean, it's just a block of wood or it's a metal, right? They can't in and of themselves help you out, but the Bible also speaks of demonic powers behind idols, behind witchcraft. In Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 16, it says, they provoked him, they provoked the Lord to jealousy with foreign gods. With abominations, they provoked him to anger. So they're worshiping these foreign gods. And look what it says, verse 17, as they worship the foreign gods, it says they sacrifice to demons, not to God, to gods they did not know. Might not know it, but you get engaged in idolatry, and behind the idolatry, there's spiritual forces of darkness. Satan and his demonic pals, they are here to steal, kill, and destroy. And because Satan and his demons are real, it isn't any wonder then that there are so many false religions in the world. It just makes sense. When God created everything and, and he revealed to Adam and Eve who he was, there was 
one true way, but because Satan fell and he entered into the picture, he's been entering in so many false deceptive ways since cre the dawn of creation. And so it doesn't come as any surprise that there's all these lies all around us. And here's, it's also possible for people to pray to false gods and receive an answer. But the one answering might not be who they think are answering. So they would use this divination stick and they would get an answer. Some things would happen. I can reflect back upon a time, even when I was in middle school, I had a friend who he and his mom, they were into witchcraft. And he was the one that started introducing me to like Ouija boards and things like this. And we began to use them. And I'll tell you what, it worked. It actually worked. You'd have this disc and this pointer and it would move. And I'll tell you what, there was enough that I know that wasn't an elaborate scam by my friend. Like it, it was actually working as we're trying to communicate with quote unquote what I thought was there's good spirits. They can help you. You know, you could just engage this way. There was a real spiritual power behind it, but that power was not from the Lord. We were getting an answer, but that answer was not from the Lord. The powers behind such things, the powers that lie behind false gods are demonic powers that will lead you astray. And our hope and our confidence must be in the true and living God, lest we look for shortcuts or try to receive answers elsewhere just to satisfy our flesh in the moment. In Deuteronomy chapter 13, verse 1, it says this, If there arises among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and he gives you a sign or a wonder. Some miracle happens. And the sign or wonder comes to pass, of which he spoke to you, saying, let us go after other gods. Now they're telling you something that contradicts what Scripture says, which you have not known. And he says, let us serve them. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. And you shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice. You shall serve him and hold fast to him. But a prophet, that prophet or dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he's spoken in order to turn you away from the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of bondage to entice you from the way in which the Lord your God commanded you to walk. So you shall put away the evil from your midst." I, look, at I, I have seen, and I'm sure you have too, I've seen Christians look to horoscopes or enneagram instead of waiting upon the Lord. And we're, we're looking to stuff, Christians are looking to stuff rooted in paganism instead of waiting upon the Lord and trusting in His Word. He, he's given us all that we need for life and godliness in the Scriptures. And, and Christians are turning to these other things, pagan sources, so that they can try to discover some sort of real spiritual insight and the direction that they need to go to as believers. And I'll tell you what, this is idolatry and false worship that's entering into the church. And there, there's also a new Christian prayer app called Hollow, and that's making its way into the evangelical church as well so that they can lead Christians into better and deeper prayers. But I'll tell you what, it is filled with all sorts of Eastern mysticism. It's leading people to transcendental meditation and all sorts of prayers for saints and things like this. All things which are expressly forbidden by God in Scripture. But the excuse to keep using these things is, well, it works. It, it seems practical. It's helping me out. I'm, I'm getting an answer. I, I got an answer, and it seemed to help and work out. The question is, is that answer from the Lord? You know, the stick gave me an answer. Well, okay. Is that from the Lord? So what if the stick gave you an answer? <laughs> is it leading you into his truth? Into a greater and deeper trust in God alone? That's a much better question to ask than, well, does it work? Lots of things work that are not from the Lord. 
Verse 13 of Hosea 4, they offer sacrifices on the mountaintops and burn incense on the hills under oaks, poplars, and terebinths because their shade is good. Therefore, your daughters commit harlotry and your brides commit adultery. Once again, we see the appeal of the flesh when it comes to false worship. Their shade is pleasant. The access to the places of worship are convenient. They're on the high places. I mean, who wants to take a journey all the way down to Jerusalem to the temple? We got these convenient high places right here. And you can swear an oath in Yahweh's name right here. Just worship at the high places. So often, false worship is just con convenient worship. Convenient worship. Once again, Israel is looking to the shade. Literally, the word is shadow of these false idols to satisfy them. When God himself is to be the one whom they come under his shadow, under his protection. You'd come near to him and you'd, you'd be under his shadow, his guard. God is to be, to be Israel's comfort, his delight, his protection. In Hosea chapter 14 and verse 7, it says, Those who dwell under his shadow shall return. They shall be revived like grain and grow like a vine. Their scent shall be like the wine of Lebanon. Lord, help us just to realize that it's only under the shadow of your wing that we can truly find comfort and protection and joy that we were created for. Verse 14 of Hosea 4, I will not punish your daughters when they commit harlotry, nor your brides when they commit adultery. For the men themselves go apart with harlots, and offer sacrifices with a ritual harlot. Therefore, people who do not understand will be trampled. Now here God condemns the lack of godly male leadership within the nation. And he points out how this lack of, of male spiritual leadership has led to a deterioration and a morality and righteousness crisis within the land. God says, He'll not punish the daughters when they commit harlotry. Now, it's not, that, it's not that the daughters are not going to come under God's judgment. Uh, they, they are caught up in a cycle of sin. God is going to end up causing some judgment to come. It's just that they don't seem to be as deceived about the severity of just how things how bad things are, like the priests of the land would have been informed and known. For verse 14 says, the people who do not understand will be trampled. They have less understanding. Yes, judgment's going to come. It just seems that there's a difference in severity of how this judgment is going to, to be played out. They'll be judged, just not with the same measure of judgment. And so it's like what the book of James says, My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. We receive a stricter judgment. You, 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 you know what the scriptures say. You, you understand what this says, but you're not living it out. You're going to be accountable for a whole lot more than someone who doesn't know what this book says. They're still going to be accountable for whatever amount of revelation they've rebelled against. In Luke chapter 12, verse 48, it says, But he who did not know, yet committed things deserving of stripes, shall be beaten with few. For everyone to whom much is given, from him much will be required. And to whom much has been committed of him, they will ask the more. To whom much is given, much is required. The Bible is clear that there are differing degrees of punishment in hell, just like there's differing degrees of reward in heaven. And, and I'll tell you what, uh, the, the person who has the least amount of rewards that's in heaven is going to be super stoked that they're there, and the person who is receiving the least amount of punishment in hell is going to wish that they were never there. They're going to wish that they were never there. But it's clear that the Bible does teach, that God. I mean, he judges fairly. There's, you know, if there's, 
someone who tried to live like, uh, you know, they're just kind of living a standard, basic, good life by the world's standards, but they never gave their life to the Lord, they're not going to be held to the same level of judgment like a Hitler or Stalin would. It's going to be different, right? In Matthew chapter 11, verse 20, Here's Jesus, it says, Then he began to rebuke the cities in which most of his mighty works have been done because they did not repent. He's revealing himself, doing miracles. The, the Messiah has shown up and he's doing miracles. And he says, Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. And look at this, verse 23. And you, Capernaum, who are exalted to heaven, you'll be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Sodom. For we're talking about Sodom and Gomorrah. If the works that were done in you, remember, Capernaum's a place where the paralytic man, they dug through the roof, they lowered him down, Jesus healed them. All this stuff was happening there in Capernaum. They were done in Sodom and would have remained until this day. But I say to you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and the day of judgment than for you. That's crazy. God's judgment is perfect. And the severity of God's judgment is based upon how much revelation a person rejects or rebels against. More revelation was given to Capernaum than had been given to Sodom. And so guess what? I mean, both are facing judgment. You know, it's like, it's not like the people in Sodom are showing up at a good place. They're like, yay. No, I mean, it's rough, right? But they had less revelation then Capernaum, so Capernaum, because they rejected and rebelled against more of what God had revealed, they receive a stricter judgment. Some try to say, you know, well, like, 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 it's like well, sin, sin. So oftentimes that's you. It's like all sexual sin is the same. In one sense, I will say, all sin is the same in that it's rebellion. But it varies in degrees of, of rebellion, sin does. It really does. So, so in one sense, all sexual sin is rebellion. But, and, and in that sense, if, if someone does not repent and turn to the, to the Lord for any of their sins, including their sexual sins, then they will have to pay for that sexual sin on their own in hell for eternity. That's just what the Bible talks about. God sent his son so that we can turn to him and trust in him. We don't have to pay for our sins. He paid for them. But here's the thing. Some sexual sin... Just, just know this, some sexual sin does involve a greater rejection of God's revelation than other sin, other sexual sin. And, and so I think it's very clear that, that heterosexual sin is sin, and it ought to be rebuked. We ought not to stand for it, but it is different than homosexual sin. With homosexual sin, you have to rebel against more revelation that God has embedded in creation. It's just like even when we take it a step further and we go, well, well, is heterosexual sin the same as like bestiality? It, there's a, a vast, you're, you're rebelling against even more revelation because you're stepping out of your created kind and engaging with a sexual activity with an animal. It, that's more revelation that you're rebelling against. So, I'm not trying to minimize heterosexual sin at all. I'm just saying there is a difference in degrees of rebellion that we have against God's created order and against his design and against what he's revealed, and we just ought to be aware of that. And thanks be to God, Jesus came to die for all of it, right? He really did. He died for all of it, and he's willing to redeem and to restore and to transform if we would but just turn to him and trust in him, whoever we are, whatever we've gotten caught up in, where, wherever our own deceitful desires have led us, if we would turn to him, he's willing to redeem and to restore and to transform. Verse 15, though you, Israel, play the harlot, let not Judah offend. 
Do not come up to Gilgal, nor to Beth-Avon, nor swear an oath, saying, As the Lord lives. Even though Hosea's message and ministry was primarily directed to Israel in the north, not Judah the south, the message is still applicable for them. Uh, they were to heed the warning so that they would not fall into the same trap. And the temptation for many in the northern part of Judah was to say, well, we, maybe we could just, uh, we can just go to Beth-Avon or Gilgal, and uh, we, can, we can swear an oath to the Lord there. Uh, that'll save us some time. We don't have to travel down to Jerusalem because those places were closer in proximity to where they were at, at the northern edge of the southern kingdom and where these false places of worship were all the way down to the, the southern edge of the northern kingdom. I got a picture I'll show you. Hopefully, I zoomed in enough. I hope it's there. <laughs> but you can, you can see on the left-hand side, there's Israel in the north, kind of in the reddish color, and then Judah down south in the purplish color. And I got a red box kind of highlighting right where that border is. And then look over to your right, and I got two boxes there. I hope you can see it. If not, it's there. Let me see. Let me see. At the very edge of the border there, there's Bethel. And in this map, it shows Beth-Avon, too, as two separate cities. I tend to think Beth-Avon is a reference to Bethel. I'll share with you why in a moment. But look at Mizpah, Geba. Some of these cities, they're right there. It would be far easy. It would be way easier for them to walk up than it would just to go down south to go to Jerusalem. Beth Hogla is right there near Jericho. And guess what? Gilgal is right there, just, just to the east of Jericho, right on the Jordan River. Gilgal and Beth Avon are significant, meaningful places in Israel's history, especially when it comes to their worship. Gilgal is the place where Israel camped after they just crossed the Jordan River. When they entered into the Promised Land, there's this massive miracle. God stops up the Jordan River. So then water just starts towering on up, and they, they cruise on over, and there's memorial stones. There's stones that were placed there in the river and stones that were brought to the other side there on Gilgal, 12 stones. And the tabernacle dwelt there for a number of years. The place eventually deteriorated into a place of false worship, and it became a substitute for going down to Jerusalem and the temple. They're like, well, something cool happened here. You know, later on, when after the temple's built, and you're like, you're supposed to go to the temple. Don't, you don't go here. Start worshiping here. This thing's to serve to remind you about what God did, the true and living God, and how you're supposed to worship him in truth. And so, Beth-Avon means house of wickedness. So there is a possibility it could be another city that's close right there to Bethel, but... There's a number of common commentators, and I happen to, to think that they're right, that Hosea is calling Bethel, Beth-Avon. Bethel means house of God. Beth-Avon, Beth-Avon means uh, house of wickedness, means house of wickedness. And so I think Hosea is just calling Bethel what it is. You remember, Bethel is the place where, where Jacob ends up seeing a vision. The angel's ascending and descending to heaven. He's like, oh, God's in this place, you know? Cool stuff has happened there. A real encounter with the real and living God has happened there, but this becomes the place where Jeroboam sets up a, an idol. And now they're, they're, they're stuff kind of associated, familiar with the true and living God, but they're not worshiping the true and living God. They're worshiping an idol. People are tempted and deceived away from worshiping God in truth simply because of its connection to something meaningful that God has done in the past, either through a person, a place, or an item. And I can't help but think of how honoring early church fathers eventually moved towards we venerate early church fathers and, well, they died and they're saints now. And now, if we're honest, they're, you know, still be called, well, we're just venerating the saints, but you're like, you're doing a whole lot more than just venerating them because you're praying to them, you're worshiping them, 
And this is something that is very prevalent in the Catholic and Eastern Orthodox Church. Uh, to, to venerate something just means to have a profound respect. So I'm like, if that's all it was, we just have a profound respect for what this church father did or what God did through this guy. I got no problem with that. I don't think any of us have a problem with that. If that's all it was, fine. But it moves beyond that. It moves well beyond that to now we're praying to this dead person as if that dead person can hear us and, and, and answer our prayers. Or oftentimes the answer is, well, that dead person can go to God on your behalf and then tell you because sometimes God's too busy. Or I was like, well, he's going to get bombarded with a bunch of saints talking to him. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't even understand the logic. <laughs> Putting your trust in them for help instead of the Lord, it superficially looks Christian. And, and there's even mentions of, of the Lord, the Lord's name, but it's a misdirected hope. And, and, and it's a misdirection for true prayer and true worship. It's actually false worship. First Timothy chapter 2, verse 5 says, For there's only one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. That's it. He, he's the only one. He's the one that we go to. There is no other mediators on that level, right? You, you, you can't go to a saint and think that they're going to mediate for you like the way Christ does. They just cannot. All true prayer in the Bible is always directed to God alone. And the only godly examples and commands that we have in Scripture about prayer is to God alone. We're not to pray to dead people, whether they were Christian or not. We're to look to God alone and to pray to God alone, and everything else is, let's just call it what it is, idolatry. It is idolatry. And Judah was to hear this word to the northern kingdom, they were to take heed and flee from any form of idolatry that they might be tempted to give in to because in the end, false worship, even if it's dressed up and married in some way, shape, or form to the God of the Bible, it will leave you ashamed and empty-handed in the end. We'll wrap up verses 16 through 19. For Israel is stubborn like a stubborn calf. Now the Lord will let him forage like a lamb in open country. Ephraim, which is the major tribe of the northern kingdom, and it's just used as a way to refer to the entire entirety of, of Israel, all of the ten tribes. Israel is joined to idols. Let him alone. Their, rebellion, their drink is rebellion. They commit harlotry continually. Her rulers dearly love dishonor. The wind has wrapped her up in its wings, and they shall be ashamed because of their sacrifices. Israel's like a stubborn calf. They don't want to be led by their master to places of good pasture. They think they know better. That's what he's saying. They think they know better, and they're distracted by their own instincts rather than the master's knowledge, trusting, hey, I know the better place to go. And because of that, God will lead them like a lamb, completely vulnerable in the open country. This is speaking of the Assyrian captivity, They'll be brought to an end of themselves so they might finally repent and trust in the Lord instead of leaning on their own understanding, but finally realize that God's ways are best. We should acknowledge Him. And it's good to realize, it's good for you and I to realize, you know what, we don't know as much as we think we know. We, we don't. It's good to realize that I can be stubborn and attracted to, to gross things. And Lord, may you help us not to love or cherish dishonorable things in our own heart. I'll end with this one final thing. As I was thinking about this, just praying and reading through this, this passage, I go walking my dog. I go, man, Israel's a lot like my dog. And you know what? I could be a lot like my dog too. She's stubborn. I mean, when you go walk her, I, I, I love her dog. I think she's awesome. But you go and walk her, and it's horrible. She's like all the time stopping, putting all four paws down, poof. I need to go over here and go smell this. I'm like, you don't want to just like stay with me, walk with me? No. Every time, she's always distracted by some smell. And then I just got to think, I was like, and the things that she's like attracted to are the same things all dogs are attracted to. She gets the whiff of something unclean that's come out of another animal. And she's like, this is awesome. I have to go over there. And I go, I, that's us. I'm distracted by other just unclean things in the world. I'm like, no. I need to go over here. And God's like, don't you just want to walk with me? 
to stay close with me. I just think, if I got to end on one note, it's like, Lord, help us, help us to recognize that we could be distracted by unclean things. That if we're living just on our instincts, we're, we're distracted to unclean things, and it's far better just to walk with the Master. Just be close to Him and stay intimate with Him. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for an opportunity just to get into your Word and to study the Scriptures this evening. And Lord, there's a lot of strong warning that comes through Hosea, and it's needful. God, we're going to spend another, another chapter working through just a, a lot of rebuke, but it's stuff that we need to be reminded of too. And so I pray that you would help us just to do spiritual inventory. And in all honesty, Lord, you search us and try us. You see if there be any wicked way in us. And then lead us in the way everlasting. We thank you for your goodness and your faithfulness to us. In Jesus' name, amen.